All right. Welcome to our uh, live stream. Um, hang on a second here. I've got to uh, send a text. All right. Are we ready? Are we ready for a live stream? Welcome to Friday. Um, wow. Again, another week goes by. I just, I'm just flabbergasted how fast time goes by. It just seems like the days go by fast and, and everything else. And so, um, for some reason, my thing looks a little bit different. Um, let me go this way, see what happens. No, it's not what I'm wanting. Um, I got obstacles all in front of my face. I can't see me. Of course, I don't really need to see me. But um, but welcome. We're gonna we're gonna pick up on Monday's broadcast. I had a request to stay on this subject, and so uh, I'm gonna stay on this subject for a bit. <clears throat> and um, a bit. I'm gonna finish up today. But uh, but on Monday I talked about the reprobate mind and. The thing about this, the, the the mind to me, in my reading of the word and, and studying, the mind is the biggest issue that we face. It's easy to get born again. It's easy to get filled with the spirit of God. It's easy to study the word. Uh, it's hard to live out life because we live life based on our how we think and our emotional components. And so um, it's it's critical as we're going to cover some some points today to see how critical it is so first of all let me just welcome everybody that's here those that are with us uh, already and those that join us uh, at a later date and um, um, we are going to delve into this now part one on Monday we we defined what the the term and we showed examples of a reprobate mind I'm not going to redo that you can go back to Monday's live stream uh, and watch all that. I do want to make a few points on it. Those who possess or are on their way to being turned over to a reprobate mind, they have some knowledge of God. And this is that that's a I wanted to rephrase that because that is very important. It's actually in the deception of what we know about God that creates the atmosphere that we can be turned over to a reprobate mind because we think we know. And, uh, and I, I say this all the time, um, you know, there's things that we do, there's things that we say. Uh, what's that old saying? Um, is it something like actions speak louder than words? Uh, you can say all the niceties, you can get your Christian ease on, you can do it. But, but what we do is really the component of the heart that we need to deal with. And, um, and our minds will create a pathway to fulfill what's in our heart. And that's that's really where the uh, uh, where the elements are. So they have some knowledge of God. Uh, they have, there's impurities in their lives. There's things that they adopted. We see it a lot now where people are really trying to uh, indoctrinate people on anti-biblical things. Um, the, the drinking uh, with Christians is just like over the top. I mean, uh, it's amazing the number. Oh, you know, take a little wine for the stomach. Yeah, well, wine is also a mocker. And uh, how do you work that one in there? But yet you have a, a lot of Christians talking all the Christian ease, but they got alcohol problems. Um, you've got all the people talking against uh, the tithe. Well, that's Old Testament. It doesn't apply to us. They got greed issues uh, because the tithe is never done away with in the Bible. So there's impurities in our lives justified by some knowledge of God that God will just turn us over to it and say, hey, you go rock on on what you do. And we've got to come back to what's working and what's not working uh, in our lives. And we justify the impure things that we do from the little knowledge, which I just said. So uh, those who God turns over to their own way of thinking is the reprobate mind. It's like we've built a resistance to God and God finally says, hey, go do it the way you want to do it. Uh, hey, Ian, good to see you. Uh, Joyce, Mom, Eileen, Marie, Reba, um, good morning, good morning, good morning. Uh, those, so so it, it, it's not my interpretation. 
God's trying to lead us into what he wants us to do. He's trying to instruct us. But we're very insistent upon doing it our way. And we reach a point where God says, go ahead and do it. You think you know everything? Walk in the, the voidness of your mind. Walk in the futil futility of your mind. And he just backs off. And the problem, the problem stems in this from not desiring to please God. And, uh, and so we have to, um, when we do this, we're actually willingly rejecting God. Uh, you remember when uh, Samuel, Saul, uh, did not go in and uh, kill all the Amalekites. And Samuel came and, uh, you know, the kingdom was taken away from him and Samuel hacked Agag to pieces. But do you, uh, I didn't look it up, but do you remember the, the terminology? that he utterly rejected God's word. He did everything that God told him to do, except for this much. He kept one person alive. One. Killed the whole nation except one person. And he destroyed all the animals except the best of the best. Now, I don't know how many that was, but, you know, the best of the best is not going to be the majority because most things have flaws in them. So he did, we could say he did 95, 97, 98% of everything that God told him to do. Yet, Samuel says, you've rejected God. And because you rejected God, God will reject you. I want to, I want to read this. I wonder if I can find it real quick. I heard somebody recently talking about this, but it was funny because um, I'd probably be in the book of Samuel. That would definitely be in the Old Testament. Hearken to the voice of people on the safe of the air. Okay, so it's here in 1 Samuel 15. And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great a delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken or to listen, uh, better than the fat of rents. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry, because thou hast rejected the word. Now he said he rejected the word. Doing 95, 97, 98 percent. I don't know exactly what the number is, but he did everything, kept one person alive. Thou hast rejected the word. So when we are, when we don't walk in what God wants us to walk in, we are rejecting his word. And he says it's uh that that rebellion is the same. Now, most Christians would not actively participate in witchcraft, yet he says rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft. Um Rejected the word of the Lord. He has also rejected you from being king. I heard somebody, I started, man, I heard somebody talking about that, those chapters. And it's like, are you, are you really doing what God says? Because it's a nice little fluffy statement. I saw all the comments and all the pluses and everything like this. And I'm wondering, because see, if, if you are a non-tither, you have rejected the word of God. If you are not in the church that God wants you in, you are rejecting the word of God. Uh, if you forsake the assembling of yourselves together, you are rejecting the word of God. If you walk not in love with everybody, you are rejecting the word of God. It, it's now it comes to why, why would we do that? Now, Saul, if we go going to study that, Saul had his reasons. Well, the people, you know, they want to do this. We took the best of the lambs so that we want to offer, you know, sacrifices to God. I mean, he had all of his rationale, which was what? Thinking. He, he analyzed a situation. He determined what would be the best course of action, even though that best course of action was contrary to what God had said. And God says, because you rejected me, I'm going to reject you. you. You really believe so strongly in your own thinking? Rock on. See how it works for you. The promises and provisions are being taken away. So, willfully rejecting. 
No desire to please God. Now, I, I talked in on Monday how to avoid, and we started off in Joshua 1.8. Joshua 1.8 um, says that the book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt, thou shalt have good success. And I broke it down. Basically, in more modern language, God said, um, uh, speak the word of God. Think the word of God and do the word of God. These right here are the key to not being turned over to a reprobate mind. What does God say? I'm going to talk like God. I'm going to think like God and I'm going to do like God. Now, that becomes a, um, a real dilemma because we deceive ourselves. In fact, in, I used also James 122 um, that... Uh, be a doer of the word, not a hearer only, deceiving your own selves. So deception comes in when, see, and this comes where the knowledge of God comes in. I have a, a some element of a knowledge of God, but I don't do what God says. I make arguments against what God says. Now, in 2 Corinthians 5.17, we talked about it. Let me just go over there and, and read it. Um, 2 Corinthians 5. And it says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Now, you have to walk in the newness. And in order to walk in, live in the newness, you have to walk away from the oldness. Because to have something new departs from the old. But yet, do you know any people? Oh man, I wish I wish the church was like it was back, you know, 20 years ago. I wish we could go back to those days. No, you can't. That's the old. What is God doing today? What what can we walk in today? <clears throat> so when we start thinking about this, and oh, I don't want to pass off on that too much. Speak, think, and do. Uh you know. I, I guess it saddens me because there's a lot of people that portray themselves as spiritual that you just look at how we handle God going to church, to corporately worship, to corporately pray, to, to be encouraged, rebuked, provoked, strengthened. And we have so little respect for God that we walk in late. We're on our phones. Uh, most people, if a text come in, if a call comes in, they'll put God on hold and go take that. You see people sitting on their, their phones doing this. They're not reading the Bible. They're scrolling social media. Um, we have very little regard for God in our lives and what we do. Uh, you look around during worship. People just sit there. I don't like the song. Oh, this is not my kind of music. Uh, I said it before, you know, uh, Southern gospel is not my kind of music. Uh, but I should be able to worship God with Southern gospel because it's not about the music. It's about our heart toward God. And everything is about our heart toward God. But what allows us to walk in late, to be disruptive, to get up and move around, uh, you know, during the service, become a distraction. Uh, all these things is because our heart is on ourself. And I, I've said it many times, if, if honor is in you, honor will come out of you. When you're in a situation and you're honorable, honor will come out of you. you. If you honor God, you can't do these things. If you honor God, you can't create a, dis, a, a division, you know, a separate vision than the church that you're in. You can't do it. It won't allow you to do it. Your heart, honor, it won't allow you to do it. You will be in sync, um, you know, with that. I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to be part of the solution. You, if you have honor in you and you're in a church, you can't not be part of the ministry of helps. We're all a part of the ministry of helps, according to Corinthians, and you can't not be. But there's many people sitting in churches. They come in. They, they enjoy the air conditioning, they enjoy the heating, they enjoy comfortable seats, 
um, they they don't give anything to to help uh, you know that there there will be meat in the house because they believe that that tithing is Old Testament and you know they drop a ten dollar bill a five dollar bill uh, even a twenty dollar bill nowadays you know in there when because there there's no honor within them. My vote is to shut the church down. My vote is to shut God down. And even when I'm here, I'm really more interested in what people are saying and talking to than I am what God. Well, I've heard that message before. I know this. Uh, you cannot hear the word of God and not get something new out of it, even if you've heard the exact same message before. When you have a heart to receive. And this is where, what, what is all this? The battle of the mind. I think that what I'm doing, I, I'm okay with God because I have a knowledge of God. I'm okay with God. And I think what I'm doing is okay because I know God. Well, you really don't because God really, as I've said many times respectfully, has a God complex and he believes people should adhere and honor him. So if we go from Genesis to Revelations, the battle between God and man is between what we think versus what God thinks. And actually, we can predate Genesis and go to, to Satan and Lucifer in heaven. Lucifer had an idea to, ra to, to rise against God. It was a thought process. It was a battle in the mind. Now, now God, who would not allow a thought to rise above who he is, Jesus said, you know, I saw him as, or I think it's in Isaiah, actually. I saw him as lightning fall from heaven. No, I think it's in the New Testament, too, uh, that Jesus said that. can't really remember where it's at. Uh, if God is not going to allow an archangel to have his way, why do we think we can have our way in the presence of God? Because it's a battle of the mind. So let's go all the way back to Genesis chapter 3. When, when God has a problem with his people that he created, Adam and Eve. Uh, Genesis chapter 3 verse 1 says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And the serpent said unto the woman, Yes, hath God said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden. The woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. But of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said unto the woman, You shall not surely die. And he goes on in, uh, well, let's just go ahead and read down to verse 6. For God does know that in the day that you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and you shall be as gods, knowing good from evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. How not that whole passage right there on how Eve thought? How Eve perceived? How Eve felt about what God said? It's a thought process. Um, it's the thinking that messes people up because we do not think and hold ourselves to a discipline to think like God. We actually, it's funny to me how people present themselves, especially ministers, as being something, you know, holier than thou. And the reality is, I don't care how close you walk with God, without God, you have no walk. And yet, yet people want, uh, I was listening to a conversation, I was in, the, in a conversation one time where, where people were talking about accomplishing something within a ministry. And one person was talking and they, they carefully crafted their words where it was about the ministry. But you can see in it, if you knew the person, uh, obviously, if you don't know the person, you don't know where they're coming from, but they were trying to position themselves into and, and get something that would move what they wanted to do to a forefront. Um, what is the focus? Because all this comes from, from thinking. 
Now, taking Eve, Adam and Eve, and Eve's having this conversation, and, she, and it's it's a realm of thinking that is going contradictory to what God has said. How long did it take her to get to that place after being created? Well, we don't know exactly, but we, we can get a good idea. Turn the page there and go to Genesis chapter 5, verse 1. This book of the generations of Adam. Okay, this is the book of the generations of Adam. So they're, they're going to give us Adam's time frame. In the day that God created man in the likeness of God, made he him. So, so we're starting at the day when God formed Adam out of the dust of the earth, blew the breath of life into his nostrils, and he became a living soul. Male and female created him, them and blessed them and called their name Adam in the day when they were created. And Adam lived a hundred and thirty years and begat a son in his own likeness after his image and called his name Seth. So from the day of creation to Seth coming along, third son of Adam and Eve, to Seth was a hundred and thirty years. Now, Cain and Abel had already had their uh, had their ordeal. Abel is now dead. Cain is cursed of God. So how old was Cain and Abel uh, when Cain killed Abel? We don't know. But we can assume they weren't three. Probably assume they weren't eight. Likely they weren't 15. You know, they, they had their, uh, one was raising cattle and one was, was growing crops. So, okay, we could say 20. We could say 25. I got something in my eye. We could say 25, um, you know. So if if Adam was, or I'm sorry, if Cain was 25 when he killed Abel, likely he was over. Oh, it was in the New Testament. Thank you, Joyce. Luke 10, 18, how he saw Aiden, uh, Satan fall from heaven. <clears throat> <clears throat> so, how many years did, did this say? 130 years. So, if we go 130 minus 25, which we, we know is 105. Okay, we're at 105. Um, how long before, how long from out of the garden till um, Eve got pregnant with Cain, with Abel? Were they twins? Were they separated? You know, was there their years in between them? How much after Cain killed Abel was Seth born? So we got maybe a hundred years. We could extrapolate it out if they were a little bit. Probably, I think we could safely say from 80 to 100 years. They were in the garden walking with God. Everything was working perfect. They had no problems or anything. But it took just eight to 10 generations. No, not generations, decades to question God from a perfect environment. How long did it take Satan to to resist God's authority and think that he could exalt him? When was he created? We don't know. The Bible doesn't say. But we all have this <clears throat> element within us where the battlefield is the mind. We question, we analyze, and within that, we start moving away from what God said. We don't like it. That's where the danger becomes. And especially if you know, have some understanding of the Word of God. You, you just cannot, you cannot get along this. Now, the person that is going over to a reprobate mind, they will never hear this. Do you know why? Because they have some knowledge of God. And, and I've said it many times. It's kind of my principle of life or one of my principles of life on how people operate is we judge others by what they do and we judge ourselves by our intentions. Because of my knowledge of God, I intend to walk with God. Because I've understood God, I intend. Now, I, I'm doing this thing over here which God's word outlines that I shouldn't be doing that. 
but I intend to walk with God. I love God according to my words, but Jesus said, why do you say you love me and don't do what I say? Put the bottle down, put the marijuana down, uh, put the, the other things down, get yourself into the house of God, turn the TV off and pray. Not that TV's wrong, you know, depending on what you want, but spend more time in prayer. Um, put the extra taco down and fast, <laughs> you know, the bowl of ice cream, pick on myself here. See, how much do we walk with God? There, I, I, I've encountered a lot of people. You can tell if somebody is actively in the word or if somebody is living off yesterday's word, because you will spend your word equity as you live it out. And now it will become something. You, you can have Christianese. You can talk about it. But you can tell, don't judge people by what they say and how they lift themselves up. Look at what they're doing and how they're living. So if we go back, let, let's go to Genesis chapter 12. Now, I'm starting it. Now, we can go through the whole Bible. And, and I can pull out stories, but I'm not going to do that because that would take, obviously, a very long time. But I, I'm purposely starting at the beginning of the Bible because this was, this is, a very predominant human problem and angel problem. Take uh, Satan, Lucifer, and the one-third of the angels. But Abraham had a problem with God. He, he was stuck in his own thinking. So God shows up to Abraham, chapter 12, verse 1. Now the Lord God said unto Abraham, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show you. Now jump down to verse 4. So Abraham departed as the Lord had spoken unto him. He departed as the Lord had spoken unto him. And Lot went with him. So he didn't follow God's command. But in, in Abraham's mind, God told him something. And he interpreted it as, now he said in verse 1, get out of your country and, and from all your kindred. You, you, I want you to separate from everybody that you are related to. Now, stop and think about this in your neck of the woods, wherever you live. And, you know, I live in California. So if God told me to get out of my country, well, actually, number one, if he said out of my country, I'd have to leave the United States of America. But I, I've got this broken geographic to get down to states. So if he says, get out from where you live, leave California. And don't get around any of your of your family. Well, I've got family here in California. Uh, I've got family by extension in laws in Utah, Idaho area. I got family uh, in Colorado. Um, I don't know of any other states where I got family. So, so number one in getting out, I could not go to any of those three states. And then. The ones that I live amongst that are really, you know, more nuclear family, they're closer. I'd have to tell them I'm leaving and you can't go with me. But Abraham didn't do that because God said, get out of your country, get away from your kindred. Now, now put yourself in that. Could, could you listen to God and walk away or would you try to take somebody with you? Well, human nature is we try to take somebody with us. You can't really fault Abraham, Abram at this time, but you can't really fault him uh, because he's thinking like a human. This is the whole battle of why we struggle with God. God thinks differently than we do. Now, when 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 you, uh, I'll just tell a quick testimony. The house we live in right now. God, uh, um, I was driving up the street, and. Um, I was going someplace. I think I was going to like Lowe's or something like that, if you're familiar. And I was driving up Court Street, turned right on camera. And where we live, there's this big open field. And there was a sign that says, coming soon, these houses. And I heard almost like an audible voice. It wasn't audible. Uh, but I heard an inward voice say, buy in the first phase of that construction. So I called my mom, who's a realtor. And I said, you know where the sign is out here? They're getting ready. Da, 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 da. I said, can you get me the information on it? So she got me the information on it. She says, David, this is the weirdest thing. And uh, because they had a very limited number, I think if memory serves me correct, eight houses, 10 houses, something like that. Uh, maybe it was 12 houses. And uh, that was in the first phase. And then they knocked it down to like 10 houses. And then, or 
three houses were going to be model homes. So now we were down to like seven houses. Let me let me count in my head. I think there was eight houses that it finally came out to that were going to be sellable. The lady that was uh, the agent for there was buying one of them. She got it. And it seems like there was one other one that was taken before the, the lottery. Then you had to put your name in to be part of the last, you know, six, seven houses, whatever it was. And then they were taking them by order. And it came down to, I think it, I think it came down to five houses. And we were number seven on the list. And now we're going back almost 20 years. So my, my numbers might not be a little or might be a little bit off, but I, I'm, you know, the premise is still the same. The story is still the, uh, correct. And so, uh, um, and then they did it on a Sunday. And uh, I really had a problem with that. And I talked to Pastor Harbaum about it. And it's like, you know, I don't want to miss church. And we went through it. And he said, yeah, you know, you probably um, probably wouldn't be a problem because it's out of your control. And the Lord told you to buy in, in this. And so, okay. So we went. And uh, Tammy's like, what are we going to do? We're number seven. And there's only five houses. And I said, well, if it's God, it's going to work out. And so uh, they called, you know, the first person. They went into the room, bought a house. They came out, put a, a marker, you know, on the uh, the house, the, the lot that they chose. And then the second person, third person, fourth person. Everybody went in there. Tammy looks over at me because they're getting ready to call the fifth person. And they call them. 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 And and nobody comes up. Uh, and then, uh, so they go to the sixth person. They call them, 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 they call them. Nobody shows up. Then they call us and we get the the, the lot that, that we're on right now. So it worked out. But now here's the thing. The difference in thinking is really my goal here. God said, buy the house. And uh, um, oh, man, I got to make a long story. I'm trying to make a long story short. Go back. This was in May. Go back to November. And I talked to Tammy because uh, we had money set aside for the house that we were going to purchase. We were believing God. You know, there were some things in our heart that we we're following after. And the Lord spoke to me to, to sow $25,000. Now, um, that was going to take up a, a huge chunk, the, the majority chunk of what we had saved for the house that we were going to purchase. And I'm like, man, God, that's what, that's what we're going to buy a house with. You, you're going to have to talk with Tammy about that because um, I'm not just going to make that decision. And so um, uh, and so um, I, I, we were, I remember we were in the, her mother's uh, jacuzzi sitting on the backside of the house looking over Cache Valley. It was really nice night stars were all there it's nice and crisp and cool outside and the jacuzzi was like nice and hot and steamy and so uh, i told her and i told her i don't want you to give me an answer now you know just pray about this and everything like that and uh, she's like david she goes sonny i pray about it she goes well you're speaking i mean there was just a peace that came over me on it let's do it it's like okay so we did it now we sewed god told me where to sew it we sewed into it now go back to the principles of seed time and harvest uh, that when we sow, some produce 20, uh, 30, some produce 60, some produce 100 fold. On a $25,000 sowing, at the lowest level, a 30 fold return, that would be $750,000. Okay, that's twice the amount of what we were paying for the house. It was 346, I think, if memory serves me correct. And, uh, and the Lord tells me, buy a house in the first phase. Well, we got into the first phase, so buy the house should work, shouldn't it? Okay, but David now translates buy the house, and we buy it with debt because isn't that how you buy the house? If you're going to buy a house, you get a down payment, and then you mortgage the rest. But I've got seed in the ground that will produce twice as much as what the house costs. What am I talking about? I'm talking about the battle of the mind. We don't think the same way God thinks. And so we, we're prone to miss what God is saying. 
because we interpret it based upon our our own mindsets. So so we ended up buying the house using debt, which I'm still paying on today. But had I have heard and understood what God had said, the house would have been paid for. Now, let's go to Isaiah chapter 55. What am I talking about? Reprobate mind. Now, I did not, in, and here's where the, the difference becomes. I was not intentionally rejecting God's word. I reduced God's word to my way of thinking. Do you see the difference? Saul rejected God's word because God told him utterly destroy them. And he made a decision. I don't want to utterly destroy them. I want to save the best of the, the livestock. And I probably should honor the king and not kill him. We can take him and mock him. Okay, so he made a decision that went contrary. I made a decision out of ignorance. I should have listened exactly to what God said. So where do, where do we get turned over to a reprobate mind? Well, our desire is to not please God. That we willfully reject what he says. So when we make a decision to forsake the assembling of ourselves together, and, and I, you know, hey, I understand we take vacations and, you know, there's things that, that happen where we physically can't go to church. Uh, except I would say on vacation, go to church on vacation. Oh man, what are you doing? I'm on vacation. Uh, because you love God and you honor his word. Um, and so now with live streaming, it's easy. You can be in your own church's service. But anyway, uh, when we make a decision, I've got to do this and it's going to keep me out of church. I've got to Man, I've got work I got to get done. My business is more important. Or I, uh, um, or I, uh, um, uh, you know, I, I got to get my grass cut. And I, I just don't have time. And I'm going to, I'm not going to go to midweek service because I want to cut my grass. We are willfully rejecting the word of God. Now, I brought it up on Monday. Where's the line of how far we can go? Before God says, go ahead and do it your way. I'm going to turn you over to it. I'm going to just, I'm going to stop trying to lead you. I'm going to stop trying to draw you in because you are just going to do it your way. And so in doing it your way, the, um, I, I just let you do it and I'll let you have your own devices. So in Isaiah 55, verse 7, let the wicked forsake his ways. Now, one, we can extrapolate from that. Doing it your way, doing it my way is what's called wickedness. See, sin, uh, rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. When, when we are not honorable to authorities, we are willfully rejecting God's word. How do you talk to a police officer if they pull you over? How do you talk to your spouse? How do you talk to your boss? How do you talk to anybody that has a position of authority over you? Or do you think that in your basis of knowledge of God that you are higher than that? See, now we're, we're, we're let the wicked forsake his ways. Now, we would not call ourselves wicked because we have some knowledge of God. Remember another time when Saul went out and Samuel delayed, and he says, man, the enemy's all around us. We have got to offer sacrifices to God before we go into battle. Isn't that a good thing? He wanted to do what God had established for them to do before they went into battle, but he was not authorized to do it and yet he tried to lift himself up. Let the wicked forsake his ways. The wicked forsaking their ways is the process of dying to self. Now, the person that does this habitually, they take their, their limited knowledge of God and they try to validate, I know how to walk with God, but what they're doing is contrary to the word of God. 
let the wicked forsake their ways. And again, I ask, like I asked on Monday, where is the line where we've gone too far? I don't know. I don't know. Only God knows. It's probably different with every person because, you know, Hebrews says that that he's able, the uh, sword of the Spirit is able to uh, decipher between the thoughts and the intents of the heart. You, your thoughts will justify where you're going and what you're doing. The intents of the heart is you're trying to lift yourself up. Let the wicked forsake his ways and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Now, now stop and think about this. To forsake your thoughts is a violation of self. They're your thoughts. I, I don't care how wackadoodle a person thinks. To them, it is normal. Have you have you ever been with somebody and they're expressing themselves and, and you're thinking, you know, what planet did this guy come off of? Where, where did where did they get their ideas from? This is this is so stupid. But but they believe it and it's normal to them. You know, the the flat earth society, they believe. Did you see that meme? It says like something, it has like the sun and the planets going, you know, out to Pluto. And uh, it says, well, this is awkward. And it has all the planets, they're round balls. And then the earth, it hits a flat, uh, you know, rectangle. <laughs> kind of funny. But uh, they believe that NASA, when they were at the moon out in space, took pictures of the, the earth, that it's all propaganda. <clears throat> they believe it. They believe it. They believe if you get in a boat and uh, you you start going, you will end up going off and I guess fall into the abyss or something like that. They believe it. Uh, there's there's people who believe in the phrase, "It's my body, it's my choice." Well, how come you're you're pushing for abortion, but how come you're not pushing for prostitution? How come you're not pushing for the legalization of, of heroin, meth, and, and other, you know, hardcore drugs? Why, why are you not, you know, why does your philosophy on my body, my choice doesn't apply to, I can do whatever I want to. How come you're not walking down the street naked? It's your body. It's your choice. See, see, we, we, we pick and choose things and we have ideas of what, and this is where the, let the unrighteous man forsake his thoughts. The problem is, is our thoughts are our thoughts and our way. The, the, one of the, the, the things that I just find stupid, um, and, uh, uh, and that's racism. You know, I say that people have been people ever since people have been people. And yes, the shades of our skin are different. The co coarseness or fineness of our hair is different. Um, you know, the shape of our cheekbones and our eyes are different. Uh, everybody's different. And yet people use that as a basis to think one person is better than another person. I, I just don't even get the ration, <clears throat> the rationale behind it. And obviously racism has been, you know, almost as far as man has been. Um, but I, I just don't get it, but it's man's ideas. They think that this really matters. That, that because the tone of our skins, now I, I tease Tammy all the time because of how white she is. And, um, you know, that, uh, uh, you know, whatever, I just tease her and the girls too. And um, uh, I can go out in the sun and I can catch some rays and get, um, uh, I can get, I used to be able to get pretty dark skin. Now, like, because I, I, I like never wear short pants. My, my legs have been so far gone from, uh, sun. I don't know if they would even get tanned anymore, but they're, they're like really white, but, uh, but that doesn't change who I am. And, uh, uh, you know, it's funny, darker people are trying to get lighter and lighter people are trying to get darker. And yet we still have a, a race issue. I, I just don't get it. I, I just can't wrap my mind around it. Let the unrighteous man forsake his thoughts and let him return to the Lord. So in order to return from the Lord, we have to Go against our ways. We have to go against our thoughts. And the Lord will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts, God says, are not your thoughts. I don't think the way you think. I'm not going to step into your stupidity. Yet man thinks that they can redefine what God has said. So go to the, because less than 2%, they've done statistics on this. 
of those who confess to be Christian do not tithe. They rob from God. They have a justification in their mind. And they say and redefine God, even though nowhere in the Bible does it says that this has been satisfied because we have both Old Testament and New Testament. Well, that does not apply. In fact, I even had a person tell me one time, it's heresy to preach the tithe. Well, obviously, they don't read the Bible. They don't have a close walk with God. And uh, for my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. So in order for me to walk with him, in order for me to to go with him, I have to forsake me. Wow. Kind of sounds like dying to self, doesn't it? I have to forsake me. So I think the key of where the line is, because we all have this battle. In fact, I've wrote a couple of books. I'm playing tug of war with God. Uh, we all have this battle of we want to do it our way. And we want God to bless us. But God says, you know, all of the promises of God are in him, that we have to think and do the way he thinks and do. So he says, talk like me, think like me, do like me. Joshua 1.8. Now, my opinion, this is David. We humans today, Christians today are anti-law. You know, that's why they say that's Old Testament. That's everything. Um, you know, that's that that doesn't apply to us. We're under grace and, and everything like that. Um, but most people want law. Why? Because they want to know that they can do something without it having a repercussion in their life. That to say, because there's no place in the Bible that that God says that the tithe is no longer holy and that it stops. I want a law that says I don't have to tithe. I can just do what I want. They, they typically, even on the tithe, which is talking about offerings, let a man purpose in his heart, 2 Corinthians 9, and so let him give. Okay, so I've got the right to give as little as I want, as big as I want, and they forsake that the way you measure out is the way it's going to be measured back to you. So I want the part where I can determine what I give and I want the blessings of God to come in my life I don't want any repercussions of not doing what God has said. So, so we're anti-law on one side, but really the only side that we're anti-law on is on the things that we don't want to do. Now go to Romans chapter 8. Hope this is making sense. What am I talking about? A reprobate mind. Uh, and, and really how we think. Now, most people's thinking is so closely tied to their emotions, their emotions governs how they think. I'm going to make a decision based on how I feel right now, not based on what God said. And this is the battle of sin, is because every sin is is preluded by a thinking, uh, and uh, and a a uh, a feeling and wanting to apprehend something that we shouldn't apprehend. So Romans eight fourteen says. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. But to be led by God, th this verse right here is harder than the law. Because the law just said, don't do this and do this, and you're okay. To be led by the Spirit is be be because the Spirit of God dwells within us. My mind and my emotions have got to come into conformity with the Spirit. And because nothing pleases God without faith, without faith, it is impossible to please God. The way the spirit will lead you is contrary to what you want or what your emotions are. Because it's going to take faith to do it because you're not so inclined on the natural side of you to do it that way. I hope that makes sense. We, we've got to not yield to how we feel and what we think and making justifications for what God has said. God's thoughts are so far above our thoughts as the heavens are above the earth, so is his thoughts and his ways. You and I cannot, cannot think to his level unless we've gone through, turn a couple pages to your right, to Romans 12, 
unless we've gone through a renewal process, be not 12 to be not conformed to this world, you're going to have to, to go contrary to the culture and the way that you've been taught and be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now, stop and think about the renewal process. Well, it's Joshua 1.8. Uh, speak like God, think like God, do, do like God. Okay. But those things that, that he says, those things that we think on and, and we rehearse in our mind to where they become native thoughts to us, are go, going to go contrary to what we want. Because who in the world wants to give up 10% of your income that, that you perceive it is yours to, we don't say to God, to a church. And, and now all this struggle and fight I'm trying to get to survive, I'm going to only, now I got to reduce it down to 90% to survive on. And then I'm told to give an offering based on my heart. That 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 takes faith to do that. That takes a denial of self to do that. Why do I have to go sit in a church building and sing songs with other people, pray with other people, and listen to a message <clears throat> from another person? Because God said to. Because God established it. Yeah, but don't you know me? I've got to work. I, I work 40 to 50 hours a week. You know, I sleep, um, let's just say eight, eight times seven is what, 56. I sleep 56. 56 and, and 40 is 96 hours. There's only 168 hours in a week. And I've got to mow my lawn. I got to wash my car. I got to do this and that. When, when, when's it my time? When do I get to do it? So I'm going to put God over here. I'm not walking away from God. I, I just, I'm just going to put God over here in what he says. And, and I'm going to go do me. How far can we go on doing that? Go to Galatians chapter 5. But don't forget Romans 8, 14. Um, Romans 8, 14. Let me read it again. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are... The sons of God. People say, oh, you know, my my daddy father, oh, my Abba father, uh, you know, and they got all these Christian things. And it's like, but they didn't got no clue who the spirit is, how to be led by the spirit. It, it's really, you know, people, I've said it many times, people are an amazing thing. Um, it, it's, it's really interesting to see what people do. So Galatians chapter five, uh, Galatians chapter five, verse 18. But if you be led of the Spirit, and I remember the sons of God are led by the Spirit, according to Romans 8. If you be led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. It ain't a do and don't scenario. Well, I feel no conviction. Well, that doesn't mean you're not being convicted. You might have a seared conscience. You might have gone so far in doing it your way. You now are okay doing things that God doesn't want you to do. Real problem. It's a real problem with, with, with uh, Christians. They know enough of the word of God that they're comfortable with what they're doing. They have a conviction of the Holy Spirit, but they've pressed so long to get what they want that now they're okay with it. And because they think they're okay with it, because there's no conviction, they convince themselves it's okay. Do I justify things God doesn't justify? It, it, it's a big problem. It's a big problem. It's the, the system that we live in right now is not you can do this, you can't do this. Although there are, there are things in the Bible that God says, you know, forsake, don't do. Um, there are there are issues of do and don't in the, the Bible, in, in the New Testament. But once we get in the led by the spirit, how we think affects our interpretation of. Of the spirit. Um, you know, th this is where um, can they be saved? Well, I, I don't know the they you're talking about. Uh, if we get into, I, I'm assuming it's in, the, in line with the topic of what I'm talking about, of a uh, reprobate mind, it's hard. 
because a reprobate mind focuses on self. I believe you can. I believe as long as you're alive, God's trying to trying to get us. And if we will turn to him, he will turn to us. He says this throughout the Old Testament when, when the uh, Israelites would walk away from, if you will turn back to me, I will turn back to you and I'll deliver you from your destruction. So I believe that the short answer is yes. The probable answer is no, because the per person that is that has a reprobate mind is so convinced their thinking is in line with the word, they will not forsake their own ways. The, the, this person with a reprobate mind is not submitted to anything because they believe that they walk so closely with God that they know better. They will usurp their pastor's authority. They will mingle among people and create divisions based on what they want and what they heard God say and not care about the house that they're in, the body that they're a part of. Uh, it is very, it's very, and this is why James says, be a doer of the word and not a hearer only. You have to do every component of what God does because if you stop and think about it, the doing of what God says is the dying to self because I guarantee you when God tells you to do something, you're not jumping up and down typically wanting to do it because it's going to take faith to walk it out. Now, uh, so once we're led by the Spirit, how we think affects our interpretation. Think Lot and Abram. Abram heard God was in his mind's eye was going to do what God told him to do. He left country. He just took one Um family member with him. Now, somebody might bring up the point of like, well, Saul just kept one per person. Abram just took one person. How come Abram wasn't utterly destroyed or considered rejecting God and Saul was? Because Saul was, in his heart, he was wanting to do what God said. But in his interpretation, he thought on his level. There's grace in that. There's, there's, he's, he's not trying to not do what God said. He's just doing what God said based on his interpretation. But he walked like 24, 25 years before the promises ever, ever manifested into where he came to the place of stumbling not. So he still walked in the diff, the, the cause and effect of his actions. He had problems with Lot. They had to separate and split. And then, you know, King came and got him. He had to go get him. all the different things he walked through was from his decision to do this. Uh, the Arab world that we have today is because of his decision to go have a, a son uh, by by um, Sarah's handmaid. Um, and now we're, we're, we're living in the, the problems of that and how we think is a big problem. And, and you listen to people talk, you can pinpoint where their faith and their knowledge of the word is, because we all have a doctrine. The question that I bring up in this is, are we trying to correct our doctrine? If it's not working, are we pursuing why it doesn't work? Uh, I've heard people say before things like, well, I've asked God to show me if it's wrong. Well, sometimes he doesn't show us. Sometimes, remember the Bible, seek and you shall find. Sometimes we have to seek it out in his word. We need to judge ourselves, not by our intentions, but by what we actually do. Is it in alignment with the word of God? One last verse. I'm going to read it out of the ESV. And uh, uh, it goes back into Romans chapter 8, verses 5 and 6. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. Those who have a carnal mindset, those who are not pursuing the word of God, the spiritual, they are going to make decisions based upon how the natural works. Now, the natural can work with a God element in it in this respect. It's a negative aspect. I'm not talking about it's doing. The person going into a reprobate mind is trying to validate everything they're doing by the word of God, even though what they're doing is contrary to the word of God. If you live, you're, if you're trying to be somebody, you are going to do things to try to show somebody you're spiritual, you hear from God, you know what you're doing. Jesus made himself of no reputation, but nobody could challenge who he was. 
This is all carnal human nature. And if we live according to the natural, trying to be somebody, do something in the natural, trying to make today the 24-hour cycle we live in work, then we are going to come up with conclusions that are um, that are naturally based and they're not going to work. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. How do I get in Christ in this situation? For to set the mind on the flesh is death. It's not going to work. But to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. You'll, it's going to work and you're going to have peace within you. So uh, we got to close up here. If uh, uh, you live anywhere near Visalia, Tulare County, come and uh, connect yourself with Covenant Peace International West Coast, uh, where we're empowering families, transforming communities, and equipping people with God's hope. We've got to get into the realm of walking with God and the Spirit. And in order to do this, um, it says in my Bible, honor belongs to God. Revelation said, well, um, let me go here real quick on Mary's... Uh, Revelations, Revelations. What is it? Revelation 7. Well, if my pages would turn. Now they turn too far. Revelation 7, what verses 11 and 12? And all the angels stood around about the throne and about the elders, and the four beasts fell on the throne of their faces and worshiped God. Um, and saying, Blessed and glory and wisdom, thanksgiving and honor, power be unto uh, our God forever and ever. Yeah, um, we should live a life like that. And the carnal mind will not live a life about that because we're trying to be somebody. We're trying to do something. And so um, there's another place that, uh, that I like in Revelations where it says they took their crowns and laid them before uh, Jesus. Uh, I think that's very powerful because the, the crown represented the reward of what they did on this earth. Everything they worked for, everything that they did to get to the place where they were at once they saw Jesus, they took it off and laid it before him. There, No flesh is going to glory in his presence. Stop trying to glory in his presence. Try, stop trying to be somebody that is um, nobody. <laughs> that ends up being nobody. Without Christ, we're nothing. God bless you. I look forward to seeing you. We'll be back on Monday. Be in the house of God this weekend. Do not be of those who forsake the assembling of themselves together. Um, but be involved, bring your, your, your tithe and your offerings and worship God with it. Get involved in the worship, even if you don't like the song or the, um, or the genre of music, um, worship God in it and be a recipient of the word of God that is preached to you and uh, start growing in the things of God and help him or ask him to help you perfect his will in your life.